The reality is they wouldn't trust me with the whole passage of the Sermon on the Mount. The reality is they know a lawyer is not particularly prepared to deal with that. But there are two verses in here they let me have. And in just a moment, we're going to look at those as it relates to our relationship with each other. Before we do that, though, let me imagine with you a setting in this particular arena that took place about 14 months ago. The arena was turned around, and we had one of those programs that Scott McDowell talked about, The Gathering. There were 2,000, maybe 2,500 students in the arena. It was what we call Resurrection Week, where our campus ministry staff had moved uh, for several months to a moment where we wanted to ask our students the significant question. And so on that Thursday, I got to do the asking. The asking really came from the 16th chapter of Matthew, where Jesus, well into his ministry, said to those closest to him, who do they say that I am? And there was some conversation there, and then he asked the more penetrating, more personal, more important question. He said, who do you say that I am? And so on that day, we did something a little different, at least for Lipscomb. On that particular day in chapel, in the gathering, we offered an invitation. Because that question calls for a response. There is no question at this university more important than that question. As students are here for four years, as we get them ready for their careers, as we shape them to be competent in whatever those careers might be, as we affect their character and spiritually form them, there is absolutely nothing that's more profound than the answer to that question. Who do you say that he is? Well, we'd set things up, and I thought that maybe, maybe we could offer an invitation, and that wouldn't be familiar to our students, but, but we had faculty and staff down in, in the front standing there, and we just simply said, if you need to answer that question, if you have something on your heart, walk into the arms and the hands of those who you already love we went through an entire song before anyone even moved. But then a second song, and they started coming down. And before that invitation was over, 50 to 60 students had walked into the arms of people that were a part of their spiritual formation. The day went on. There was a wonderful worship at the Woodmont Church later that evening. And before 11 o'clock that night, 25 students had been baptized not in a fountain in Bison Square, but in a horse trough in Bison Square. That's a powerful question. It's a powerful question, and when I shared it with them, what I was trying to get them to realize was not to invite them into a church, not to invite them into an institution, but to invite them into a relationship with Jesus. And I said three things about that relationship. I invited him to see a Jesus who was radical, a Jesus who was relational, and a Jesus, a Jesus who was radical and relational and relevant to their lives. Well, if we think about this passage, we think about a passage of Scripture, this entire Sermon on the Mount, that if it does anything, it does exactly what Lee and Randy and others have done for us. It helps us understand how very, very radical Jesus is. And it's in the radical nature of Jesus we begin to understand the drama of this teaching. I like to think about it in terms of what is intuitive and what is counterintuitive. You know, those intuitive things are those things that we naturally do. It's just the quick human response. It's the sense of saying, I see it and I react this way. What Jesus is calling us to, though, is the counterintuitive response. He says, here's what you're thinking. Here's the easy reaction, but here's what I'm calling you to do. He says, you know that you're not supposed to murder. That's not a big issue for most of us. He says the counterintuitive moment is when you realize you shouldn't even be angry. Oh, the intuitive is to express our sexual desires however it might satisfy us. The counterintuitive is to not even think about it. Oh, the intuitive is to say when you're slapped on one cheek, 
go ahead and slap them on one cheek and, and we'll see this escalate, but the counterintuitive is to turn and, and be slapped on the other. The intuitive is when someone demands something that you have, instead of holding on to it, we give it up and even more. The intuitive is when someone compels you to work, you do the very, very minimum you can get by with, the counterintuitive says, how can I contribute even more? You know that what I have to say to you today was a joint project of, of Randy and my grandson, Weston. We started working on this yesterday and he decided to come into my office because he's living with me and they're redoing their house and he sat next to me and literally for several hours we've talked about the Sermon on the Mount. I've tried to figure out how to translate this so a six-year-old actually understands. Uh, and when we got to the, the cheek piece, it became a little more obvious. Uh, I guess it's the physical part of that that Weston could understand. And so as we're talking through this, uh, his comment was so very, very real and so very, very mature. He said, Granddad, that's really hard. He knows that at six. And we know that at ages that are much older than that, this is really, really hard. I got a text a couple of moments ago, and I think Weston is here. Who is the co-writer of my speech? Weston, are you around somewhere? Say, hi, Granddad. There he is up there. Weston, thank you for helping me with my speech. Someday Weston will be here giving one himself. It's hard. It's hard to understand this. Uh, and one of the things I confessed when I was dealing with students that day was, was this. I said, you know, I, I'm pretty good at doing church. Most of us are pretty good at doing church. But where I struggle, where I have to work really hard is doing Jesus. That's because his message and his instruction is so radical. Well, most of what you'll hear will be the issues in this passage, all those things on which we should react differently. But buried in this passage are two verses that I get to share with you today. They're verses not so much on the issues, but they're verses dealing with a process. And they're tucked in, and perhaps you've discovered them but not lingered with them. Verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that a brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled. First go and be reconciled. And then return. Come and offer your gift. We skip over that, I think, because we don't understand Jewish sacrifice. And I have no real explanation this morning. I don't get the fire. I don't get the animals. I don't get all that went on there. But I do get what was supposed to happen there. And that was that somehow, through that sacrificial moment of obedience, a relationship with God was restored. But then there's this new teaching that says, hold on a second. There is something even more significant than your relationship with God. And you say, how could there possibly be something more significant? And here it is. What's more significant is your relationship with each other. It is more important for you to leave this moment of worship, to leave this moment of sacrifice, and go take care of those things, and then come back and be a part of the sacred and the holy at this altar. Well, we think about that, and we think about a process, and we think about how it's easy to skip over that because what it calls us to is radical and different and very, very difficult. And yet, the reality is if we don't get the relationship piece with each other, we don't get the relationship piece with God. As a mediator, I got strange telephone calls, sometimes late at night. One came about 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. A church called and said, we need someone to preach tomorrow morning. And I kind of sensed something was wrong. And I said, well, tell me about it. They said, well, 
Uh, the elders fired the minister on Friday. They all resigned today, and we don't have anybody to preach tomorrow. Would you drive 100 miles and preach for us? Well, I know the Apostle Paul thinks about the ministry of reconciliation, and as he thinks about it, he knows it takes an irrational confidence. And so, irrationally confident, I got up early in the morning and drove 100 miles to a church that somehow thought I could walk in and give a 20-minute sermon and everything would be all right. So I arrived, there are three or 400 people there, and I'm preaching my best reconciliation sermon, but I know the real work won't happen during that worship service. It'll happen in the weeks to come. And, and frankly, between you and me, I'm just kind of hoping that I can get through the sermon and get out of the building on my way home without anything else happening. And I don't know what God has in mind, but God, today, just leave us alone. Let me do my best sermon and leave. And so I did my best reconciliation sermon, and I'm standing in the front after I'd offered an invitation, thinking to myself, Lord, don't let anybody come forward today. <laughs> this is really a mess, and I don't know how to sort it out. Just keep them in their seats, have them think about the cafeteria. We're going to be out of here in just about 10 minutes. And I looked down that center aisle, and the light coming in from the foyer was very bright, but I see a shadow walking toward me. And I see the shadow walking toward me, and I can begin to make out a profile. And it's obvious this is someone who's not dressed particularly well. Hair is going in every direction. And as he gets closer to me, I begin to see him. And I, I do what I've always seen preachers do. I, I walk about six feet out and put out my hand, and we shake hands. And at that moment, I smell the alcohol on his breath. And I said, you know, we're happy to have you come forward. And I, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And so I set him down on the front row. I remember that from childhood. Sit them down on the front row. Uh, and then I started looking for a little card and a pen because that would be what you'd give them next. And I found a little card and I found a pencil. I gave it to him. I said, just fill this out. And, and I'm sure these people will be happy to help you. And so we're singing several verses of the song and he's not filling anything out. And I go over and I said, you need to fill out the card. He looks at me and hands it to me. He says, I don't know how to write. And I said, well, what can we do for you? And he says, I want to be rebaptized. Now, you know we're part of a tribe. And we're part of a tribe, and sometimes our language kind of connects. And I could tell the way he said it, he was part of our tribe. He knew exactly what he was asking for. But I don't know the church's policy on rebaptism. And I'm standing up here, and they're still singing the invitation song. I go to someone who was an elder yesterday morning, but not an elder today. <laughs> and I said, Can you help me with his rebaptism? He wants to be rebaptized. And the elder said, Well, I don't know if we can do that or not. I said, Well, great. Let's debate it during the invitation song. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And he finally said, well, most people won't know that. Just go ahead and do it. And I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and so then we have this moment. The announcements are made. And as soon as the announcements are made, the curtain opens behind me. And uh, I, I baptize him. And then I lift him up. The curtains close. And as soon as that's over, they have the closing prayer and walk out. And, and so I don't know what to do. And he gets dressed and, well, I, I didn't walk out the center aisle. I walked around the church all the way back to, well, where the parking lot is. And here are hundreds of people streaming out of this building. And I look around and there sitting on a brick wall over there alone is the person who had just come forward in their church. I walked over to him, I said, you know, I'm not really the preacher here, uh, I'm just trying to do my best, but, but is there anything else I can do for you? And I'll never forget the words, he looked at me and he said, do you think you could give me a few bucks for lunch? And I did. See, what happened is because they had severed their relationship with each other, Satan had gotten in the midst of all that, the reality is they didn't know what to do with Jesus when he came down the center aisle that day. Jesus said, when you do it under the least of these, you do it unto me. 
And so this passage is saying, folks, don't miss this one. Worship is awfully important. But the relationship you have with each other trumps that. And so stop the worshiping to go get the relationship right because that has value in my story as it breaks into the world. Well, what value does it have? Well, it has the value of helping people understand something radical about who we are and how we relate. There's a companion teaching to Matthew 5. It's in Matthew 18. And the companion teaching is one that you know of, and it's really a, a passage that essentially says, look, 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 look. If you have something against someone, you need to go talk to them about it. If that doesn't work, take someone and go again. If that doesn't work, bring the body, the church community to bear on it. If that doesn't work, treat them like a tax collector or a pagan. Keep in mind before you jump to a conclusion here, how did Jesus treat tax collectors? How did he treat those who were pagans? It is not a passage, I don't believe, that is the justification for disfellowshipping. It's a passage that says, this is how you bring the fellowship back together. And so if you combine the Matthew 5 and you combine the Matthew 18, all of a sudden we come to a conclusion that's very hard to escape. It is always my turn. When it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to relationships in the body of Christ, it is always my turn. It's my turn if I'm at the altar and I remember something somebody has against me, but it's also my turn in any other situation where I remember I have something against them. It is always my turn to bring about the peace that we deserve and God has called for in his kingdom. As we think about that, we begin to realize there's a reason for it. And the reason is in the last prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. Here Jesus is a few hours before his death. Here Jesus is contemplating all that has gone on in his ministry. Here's Jesus that's looking over 2,000 years to you and me. And after he prays for himself and after he prays for his disciples, he says, I'm going to pray for all those that will follow these disciples, you and me. And then he has everything in the world to choose from, and he chooses only one thing, and that is that we would be unified, just as he is unified and one with his Father for a very particular reason, that we would be unified so that the world will know God sent him. See, we sometimes, I think, think about being unified and being together because it's more comfortable for us. We have a better time with it all. Jesus is saying, no, there's something much larger, much higher, much more profound. You need to be the unified community God is calling you to be so that those out there that are watching will be brought into this story and understand the most significant truth in our faith, and that is that God sent Jesus to this earth. And so we realize that it's not a matter of convenience, it's not a matter of just feeling good, it's really that it's fundamental in terms of our sharing the gospel message with anyone else, anywhere. And so it doesn't surprise us that he says, the altar, that's important. You need to spend some time there, but, but that's not more important in this relationship. Here you need to be called to do something that reflects who we really are. Someone has asked the question, how do we call the world to Christ unless we are the unified community he called us to be? How do we do that? And it's virtually impossible. Well, I want to close with a story of something that's outside the context of church, but I think illustrates well the power of these passages. I was called one time to a law firm in Beverly Hills, California. I was called there as a mediator because they couldn't get along. Six lawyers, and you have to understand some culture here, they are all Jewish lawyers and they're all litigators, okay? So these are folks who are in 
ethnically and religiously, the Jewish community, and they're all litigators. They love to go to court. They love to argue. They love to take it on. And unfortunately, they'd taken each other on. And so their administrator called and said, can you do something about it? Can you meet with these folks? If you don't do something about it, I think the firm will absolutely disintegrate. So I said, well, I'll be happy to meet with them. Our first meeting was at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I don't know who they were trying to impress, but it was a very formal dining room. Uh, big curtains and big windows all the way around. I walk in, there are five Jewish law partners there, one still missing. And I look around and wait for a few moments. The sixth one finally walks in, and he walks in holding a magnum of wine. Now, you're not supposed to know what that is. Uh, <laughs> But, but I'll give you a little hint. A magnum of wine is like a really big bottle. It's the equivalent of four bottles of wine. And this last partner walks in. He slams it down on the table. I said, what's that? He said, it's our firm's bottle of wine. I said, okay. I said, what's the significance? He said, well, he said, we bought this 20 years ago when we started the firm. We promised we'd drink it together on some special occasion. As far as I can tell, we'll never be together after tonight. So I brought the firm's bottle of wine. Now, I did learn something that night. What I learned is that mediation goes much better after three or four glasses of wine. <laughs> much, much better. But we got through that night and finally got through several weeks of hard work and finally got to the point where, where I was now going to leave. I had done my job, we'd put the firm back together, and I never will forget the last meeting. We're sitting there at a conference table in the office, and they said, well, well, what are we supposed to do now? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, what are we supposed to do without you? And I said, well, I can't live at your law firm. I have to leave. They said, well, well, what are we supposed to do? Can't you give us some rules? Can't you help us? Can't you leave something with us? And I started thinking, well, what would you say? Where would you draw it from? What, what message would you leave? And all of a sudden, I thought about these two passages and so I looked at him and I said, well, how about this? Let's come up with a couple of rules. How about rule number one is that when you have a conflict with someone, whether you have a dispute against them or them against you, why don't we make rule number one be that you go talk to them about it? How's that as rule number one? Well, they looked at each other and thought, well, that sounds okay. That sounds good. And they said, well, do you have another rule? I thought for a moment. I said, well, how about this? Rule number two is if that doesn't work, you try it again. Okay. You just leave what you're doing. It's so important to get this relationship right, you try again. They said, that sounds like a good rule. Are there any others? I said, yeah, there's another one, I guess. If that doesn't work, then when the firm gets together on Friday afternoon, you tell it to the firm and use the power of those relationships to get all this straightened out. How's that? And they said, that's really good. And frankly, they were a little surprised that I could come up with three rules that good. Uh, one of the lawyers looked at me and said, where'd you get that? <laughs> so this Christian looked at those Jewish lawyers and said, hey, look, that's the way Jesus taught us how to deal with conflict. And one hand shot up and this woman litigator said, I vote we do it the Jesus way. <laughs> And I vote we do it the Jesus way.